Welcome to Bedside Echocardiography. This is for the MS3 Internal Medicine Clerkship. We're going to go over a few cases. So you're covering for night float. You have a list of like 80 some patients that you're covering. And you're called to the floor because you have a 65 year old female. She's acutely short of breath and she'd been complaining of some chest pain for a couple of hours. Now her vitals, she's afebrile, blood pressure 75 over 45, heart rate of 142. She's 100% on a non-rebreather and her respiratory rate is 32. Now in your haste to get to this patient, you left your list downstairs, so you're not really sure what any of her medical problems are. She's in a little bit of distress and she's not able to answer a lot of your questions. And the nurse just kind of looks at you blankly. So your differential in this lady, she could be having a heart attack, could be cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, acute heart failure, a COPD exacerbation, aortic dissection, or maybe even Borhoff's. Pretty wide differential. So what are going to be your next steps? So let's see, what can help you quickly at the bedside to determine what's going on? Well, yep, an EKG. So you get her EKG, it looks pretty normal other than being tachycardic. Now you're thinking, okay, the EKG just showed me tachycardia. There's nothing else really going on. What mm, could I do next? Well, you thought maybe you wanted a chest x-ray, but the x-ray tech uh, who can do portable x-rays is caught up downstairs in the ED in a trauma, so that's not really available. So you think, oh, well, I could use the ultrasound. So you decide you're going to do a bedside echo. Now, if you need any reminders on how to complete a bedside echo, I would suggest this link at the bottom of the page. You'll have to type it into your browser, but this will take you to Dr. Minardi's uh, introduction to bedside ultrasound. So like any bedside ultrasound, we're answering a few focused questions. So in this case, we're going to think, hmm, is the heart beating? Is there a pericardial effusion? How's the LV function look? What about any right heart strain? And is there any obvious valve pathology? Now we're going to go over a few cases just to illustrate these points. So this is the ultrasound that you get on um, our lady. Now let's break it down by answering the questions. Is the heart beating? Well, she's still talking to you, so her heart's beating, and it's beating on ultrasound too. Is there a pericardial effusion? Mm, hmm, looking here at the pericardium and I don't see an effusion. Now how is the LV function? Hmm. LV function in this patient looks kind of crappy. Is there any RV strain? Well, if you're looking, you see the right ventricle there at the top of the screen. It doesn't look enlarged, and it looks overall pretty normal. Now, is there any obvious valve pathology? We're not really going to go over this one, um, but you can kind of see that the mitral valve there isn't opening very well, which is going to be a clue to our LV dysfunction, which we're going to go over. Now let's compare a normal heart with our patient's heart. So on the right, you have a normal heart. You can see that the walls of the left ventricle thicken nicely. There's a lot of volume change in that heart, and the mitral valve is opening wide and slapping the interventricular septum. Now if you compare that to our patient's heart on the left, you can see that there's not a lot of thickening in the left ventricle and the mitral valve is just barely eking open. So like I said, we're going to break it down just a little bit more. Let's look at this mitral valve. It's not opening very well. Normally it should be slapping the septum. The left ventricle it should be thickening symmetrically and you should have at least 50 to 60 percent volume change. And you don't see any of that there. You can see a pacer wire in the right ventricle which is a clue that this patient probably has chronic heart failure. So echo is a tool, and with everything else, you want to put it into your clinical scenario. You have this 65-year-old female with acute chest pain and shortness of breath. She's a little hypotensive, a little tachycardic. So this echo has shown you that this patient's probably in acute heart failure. Now, how is this going to help you? Well, this is going to help guide your management. This is a patient you wouldn't want to give a whole lot of fluids to, and you might want to start early on pressors. All right, well, let's go on to our next case. So we have the same lady upstairs, same scenario, same vitals. So 
you decide to do bedside ultrasound because our EKG really didn't give you a lot of information and you can do this right at the bedside and don't have to wait for other tests. So this is what you see on your patient's bedside ultrasound. So let's go through our questions. Is the heart beating? Yep, the heart's beating. Now is there a pericardial effusion? There does appear to be a very large pericardial effusion. How does the left ventricular function look? Well, it looks like that left ventricle might be working a little over time, but it looks pretty good otherwise. Is there any right ventricular strain? There's no strain. The right ventricle is not dilated. And is there any obvious valve pathology? In this image, you can't really see the valves very well to determine that. So there is definitely a pericardial effusion. Now we need to determine whether or not this is the cause of her shock. In order for an effusion to cause shock, there must be signs of tamponade. So we see the effusion. Now we need to look at the right heart. Looking at that right ventricle, there's definitely right ventricular collapse. So this would be a case of pretty severe tamponade and is likely causing our patient symptoms, which means that she needs an emergent bedside pericardiosynthesis and probably some fluids. So pericardial fusions with tamponade is kind of a spectrum. So if we look at this image on the left, we can see that there is a pericardial effusion and there may be just a little bit of tiny right ventricular collapse, but that's not really tamponade. So that would not be causing the shock in our patient. Now, if we compare it to this ultrasound here on the right, there's a very large effusion and it's causing that right heart to completely collapse. So that would be causing our patient shock and would require a pericardiosynthesis. Oh. Same lady, same vitals, same scenario, EKG was the same. So let's look at her bedside ultrasound. Now is our heart beating? Yes. Is there a pericardial effusion? Not really. Do you see any LV dysfunction? Actually no, the left ventricle looks like it's working overtime. Is there any right ventricular strain? Well, now if we look here, we can see that this right ventricle definitely looks enlarged. In fact, it looks bigger than the left ventricle, which is not normal. And how about any obvious valve pathology? Mm, I don't really see anything obvious. So we've determined that there's RV strain. So we've determined that right ventricle looks enlarged. So we think there's RV strain. So let's talk about other clues to RV strain. So the dilated hypokinetic right ventricle, which we discussed. So you can also look for a paradoxical septal motion, an apical wink, and a D sign. So we'll go over these in the next slide. So looking at our parasternal short axis on the left, this is an example of a D sign. So the right ventricle is so dilated and volume overloaded that it's causing pressure on the left ventricle which makes the left ventricle appear like a D. That's your D sign. Now on the image on the right we see the dilated right ventricle, the hypokinetic free wall, and we can also see paradoxical septal motion. So as you look at the interventricular septum, it's bowing in towards the left ventricle during systole. Now we also have something called McConnell sign or the apical wink, which you can kind of see at the apex of the heart. There's a little bit of a bowing in at the apex. All right, so we've determined that this patient has RV strain. If we take it in context with the clinical picture, it seems likely that she has an acute large pulmonary embolism causing shock. And so you would want to treat her with thrombolytics. Okay, this is our last case. So we have the 65 year old female with acute shortness of breath and chest pain on the floor. You're called to bedside again. Blood pressure 75 over 45, heart rate's 142. They put her on the non rebreather. She's adding 100%. So you're getting ready to do your bedside ultrasound here. And the patient suddenly becomes unresponsive. You look at the monitor and it shows a systole. So, like any good medical professional, you start. CPR, you are giving good high quality compressions, someone's bagging her, you're getting the crash cart in the room, everything's getting started. 
So it's time for your first rhythm check. Now on the monitor, it still shows asystole. And someone in the room, though, they're feeling on her femoral pulse, and they say, hey, I think I have a femoral pulse. You think, hmm, okay, well, that doesn't really fit. So what are you going to do? So we're incorporating our bedside ultrasound here. You can see this heart is not functioning. The left ventricle is not thickening, and there's no volume change. That mitral valve was fluttering just slightly, but that does not mean that the heart is functioning. Now we can see CPR back in progress. Now our patient, they said they thought they felt a pulse. That might be an overzealous person feeling their own pulse, and that can happen pretty frequently during a code when everybody's kind of ramped up and has a lot of adrenaline flowing. And here again, during our pulse check, we see that mitral valve just fluttering, but the left ventricle really isn't doing anything. So this heart's not functioning and CPR was resumed. Now, you can use a bedside ultrasound during cardiac arrest only during the pulse checks. Uh, you can usually throw the probe on subxiphoid there during the 10 seconds and not interfere with the high quality CPR. But in some cases, like this one, you are able to get a subxiphoid picture the whole time and not interfere with those chest compressions. Now the other useful part um, of the ultrasound during a cardiac arrest is to look for any reversible causes. So we don't see any pericardial effusion causing tamponade, which would require pericardiosynthesis. And there's no evidence of right heart strain to suggest a large pulmonary embolism that you could treat with thrombolytics. Now here we are again, just kind of taking a look during this pulse check. You can kind of see that blood is actually stagnant there in the right side of the heart and the valve is just kind of fluttering. No real function of the heart. So we have carried out high quality CPR per ACLS protocol and we don't really get any good function on the ultrasound and there's never a return of pulse and she remains asystolic on the monitor. So unfortunately at this time call time of death. So in summary, bedside echo can be useful to quickly assess the heart in patients with chest pain and shortness of breath or other related complaints. This can lead to improved patient management and therefore improved outcomes. Just remember your five basic questions when you're doing the echo. You want to look to see if the heart is beating, if there's a pericardial effusion, if there's any LV dysfunction, if there's any RV strain, and if there's any obvious valve pathology. Now this can be useful during cardiac arrest as well. You can use it during your pulse checks to look for function of the heart, and you can also look for reversible causes. Thank you for your time.